I was really fascinated by the conversation. You, you just threw down about five sentences <laughs> on pest management this morning. Yeah. Uh, and you made reference to a couple of different ferments. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you would take the time to review with me uh, those ferments, which what specifically you were doing to, uh, as these ferments, and, and maybe if you feel like you've got the bandwidth and time to dig in a little bit to what is the thinking in your approach in using these preparations for pest management? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? yeah. Cool. So the the first so they're not actually ferments. Okay. So that's the first the first little caveat is okay. that these are so Korean natural farming is all about fermentation mm -hmm. and collecting indigenous microorganisms from your forest floor. Mm -hmm. So Master Cho created this farming system and it works really well but it is very much a system that you need all the pieces for okay the one thing that he and it's also for human health as well of so course, that's the yeah. thing all the things in knf are meant to keep your body healthy as well as your food crops yes so that's why i love it and that's why i love putting it on my plants because it's really nice to use something in your crops and your farm that you're using on your body as well there's just a really beautiful synergy to it yes. that I, I just respond really well to the only caveat to that is there are no pesticides because you wouldn't put a pesticide in your body. So right. it kind of goes against traditional Korean natural farming. So Master Cho's son came along and he took his dad's work and he said, this is awesome, uh -huh. but for some areas there needs to be more. So he started taking industrial, and I, I, I could be a little bit off on this because the <laughs> Jadam book that okay. I have yeah, is yeah. in Spanish. Is I this, bought the is, wrong is one. Master, is Master Cho's book one of, no. is one of his books, The One Straw Revolution? No, that's, no, that's a different that's, person. Yeah, okay. that's a different person. He's, okay. he's amazing too, Yeah. Um, but he's more of like a do-nothing farming. So. Yeah. Yeah, so no, there's some similar book, um, similar ideologies okay. to it, but different. Okay. So Master Cho's son created an, another type of very low-cost agricultural farming, but more of a scaled-up version, and it includes pesticides, and it's Jadam, J-A-D-A-M. J-A-D-A-M. Mm -hmm. Yep. So KNF stands for Korean Natural Farming. Uh -huh. I believe Jadam has something that it stands Some for acronym, as well but, but it's yeah. yeah it's also called uh what is it extreme low cost agriculture something along those okay. lines so it could be that in korean i don't really know um so in the jadam most of those processes i don't really use he does okay. a lot of like it's called jlf jadam liquid fertilizer okay. where you pick whatever weeds you want uh -huh. you toss them in a bucket you fill it with water and you let it sit there and stagnate and kind of <laughs> rot for like six months oh my okay it's very I've, stinky I, okay. I you know pretty much if you farm you've done it on accident yeah where you yeah, dump yeah, out yeah. a bucket and you're like oh god that's horrible. yeah 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 what did i leave in that bucket <laughs> totally. six months ago like i think yeah. those were weeds at one point but yeah. yeah um so again i don't really do that but the pesticide application that he does is amazing okay so the first part is a wedding agent Okay. At JWA Jadam, Jadam Wedding Agent, and uh -huh. it's basically a Castile soap. Okay. So what you're doing is you're really making your own soap. You're using potassium hydroxide, you use water, and you use canola oil. Huh. And it gets extremely hot. Yeah. Um, when you go through the book, he gives you the ratios. I don't have them off the top of my head. Uh -huh. Um, but we'll, I'll, I can email them to you. Yeah, it's almost it's, like you're making biodiesel. Yeah. A little flavor yeah. of that going on. So yeah, sort of very similar. maybe, okay. Um, so you basically, you have a little bit of water, you add your potassium hydroxide, it gets hot. Yeah. And then you start slowly pouring in your canola oil, and then you use a paddle mixer. Yeah. So the thing with making soap normally is that you're using a lye process right. to create the heat. Yes. And what this gentleman did was he said I want to be able to make a wedding agent but I want to make it economical and I want to make it that somebody can do themselves and using lye is very dangerous so like yeah. what can we do and how do we do this and he 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 did like over a hundred experiments to get the ratios right yes and he's like it's all about the paddle mixer so okay. you take a core of this drill with like a paint paddle paint stirrer, yeah, yeah and yeah. you get down into it and you start stirring it and it starts getting hotter and hotter and hotter and it gets 
up to like 180 degrees or something. Wow. Like it's like, okay. you know, you're sweating. It's like kind of brutal. Uh-huh. Um, and then you, you take your paddle mixer out when it gets to a certain consistency, like thick mayonnaise. And, so, and this is the wedding agent that you're making. This is just the wedding making. agent. Okay, yep. keep going. Yep. This is beautiful. Thank you. So then you take your paddle mixer out and you let it set for about three days. And over the course of the three days, the heat starts to dissipate and it gets thick and it turns into like a block of soap, basically. Floating on top of some water and glycerin and no, other, whatever. No, it's solid. It it's is solid. like solid all the wow. way through. It's not solid, solid, but it's like, yeah. you know... Yeah, like, like no, it's a lard, chunk of soap. Basically, it's like lard. Wow. Okay. So then you add the rest of your water to turn it into a liquid soap. Right. And you just basically add your water and you stir it and you stir it and you let it set for a while and eventually it all dissolves and you have this amazing, beautiful liquid soap that you can use as a soap and you also use it as a wetting agent for the plants so that you can have your your water tension is broken, right? So your pesticides will stay on your leaf surface better. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. we figured out that this thing, I made a, I took a pickle barrel and I made about 48 gallons of liquid soap. I was going to ask. <laughs> I did. I don't do things small. I figure if, you're, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing yeah. at scale. And um, the cost was less than a dollar per gallon. Uh huh. So yeah. it was just like, this is, I mean, phenomenally economical. So this is a soap one could use for laundry, for yep. example, yep. or... Uh, washing one's body. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. I use it. It's now my dish soap and uh -huh. my hand soap. I put different essential oils in it for that. And then we have it as just, um, It's most of it's still in the pickle barrel, but then I have a bunch of gallon, reused gallon jugs that I can siphon it into. And then uh, it goes out to the farm. I love the specificity of actually making your own wedding yeah. agent. It's cool. And so I have a specific question about the wedding agent. Is it have... I know that some wetting agents, for example, in mild dilution in water, can be effective against small-bodied insects with yep. no additional yep. input, right? So there's a level of you using it in that context as well as perhaps other materials mm -hmm. that you might mix into a water solution to yep. make a spray. Good. I'll stop so, now. Please so, say more. Well, and so it's exactly <laughs> what you said. So um, one of the guys that I've been working with that, you know, we're trying different things and different farms and different areas and mm -hmm. coming back together with our data to see what's working, what's not. And he used just the JWA. So mm -hmm. just the wedding agent with seawater. With seawater. At sea full water. strength. With ocean water. Ocean water. Yep. Oh, you're making me so yep. happy. So the ocean water is all your micronutrients, <laughs> yeah, all yeah, of your yeah, minerals, yeah. everything. Yeah, um, yeah. Generally, that's used at a 1 to 30 dilution. But he was just going full on ocean water. And I, 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 I'd have to look at my notes and see what he did for the ratios of the JWA. But he found that that alone as a preventative was effective enough. Uh -huh. That he didn't need to add anything else. Uh-huh. So this is prophylactic use, basically, before before insects become an issue, right. before the pest is a problem. You're, uh, and it, it occurs to me that in addition to uh, <clears throat> some activity that is likely, again, hard on soft-bodied insects, there's something going on with stimulating the plant's ability to deal with pests potentially, and or making the plant less attractive to pests. Is that a fair statement as well, would you say? I would imagine so. I, I don't actually know for sure course, what yeah. that would be, yeah. but I mean, I can imagine that, yeah, if you're making the surface of the leaf you know, less attractive because, yeah, there's soap on it, like there's, it's gonna be a more difficult situation for them. Well, one of the things I was going towards in my question there is, it's my understanding that plants that are stressed due to overwatering, for example, yeah. put off a signature in a light frequency that maybe we can't see, but thrips see really well when they're in their life stage of flying about. They see this, oh, there's that's gravy train right there. Let's yeah. go do that. And so part of, part of the approach that I've taken in pest management and part of why I'm interested in this conversation with you is... Uh, it seems really clear to me that a lot of what we're doing is, is enhancing the plant's ability to deal with these creatures. Right. And then our allies in the garden, other plant bugs that might like these bugs for food, they are there to help us. But it's, so anytime that you are taking an approach of, I'm just gonna kill everything, right. 
you've really set yourself back a long yep. ways. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Cool. cool. And, Please and, keep going. And what this you're is fascinating. Is, is 100% correct. So when a plant is stressed or sick, mm-hmm. it sends out a signal that is visible to bugs, and then they'll continue to put out the pheromones that this is the one we're eating. And what we think is happening is that it has to do with the fact that sick plants have a hard time building their cellulose layers. There so it gets go. thinner, mm. right? So if it's mm. thinner, it's actually putting out a different signature of, of wavelength of color and light that we don't necessarily notice, but the bugs are very drawn to. Yes. So um, it's, it's, I mean, it's really fascinating stuff when you get into it. So for the, the basics, what I was talking about earlier too was that... Um, Ideally, you have a plant that is strong enough that it fends it off without yes. any of this extra stuff. Of course. So again, that comes down into soil health. Yes. And that comes into the base of Korean natural farming. Hmm. So there's this whole 80-20 principle in everything that we do. What you put into one thing can be 80% of the difference of, of what that... Of, of What am I trying to say? Yeah. It, there's... there's a, so if you take like Korean natural farming okay. and take it as a system, so yeah. 100%, okay. there's one part of it that is going to be 80% of the, um, the, the aspect that you see. So one part of your entire system okay. has 80% of the effect. So uh-huh. in the case of Korean natural farming, if you do one thing in Korean natural farming and only one thing, if you only do um, like an OHN, which is like my second favorite input, so Oriental Herbal Nutrient, O-H-N. fabulous for human health. It's o- O-H-N. amazing. OHN, Oriental O-H-N. Herbal Nutrient. Okay. And it's basically a tincture that's comprised of angelica, garlic, ginger. Sorry, I'll talk a little slower. <laughs> or nutrient. Yeah. yeah. Um, so angelica, garlic, ginger, cinnamon, and um what am i missing licorice Uh uh-huh and it takes three months to make you do a fermentation of that one first so that's the one you do you ferment Uh for a week first and then you start tincturing it with vodka and you end up with this warm amazing um liquor that is just like i take about a half an ounce a day if i'm getting sick Mm. otherwise i just take a little sip off of it every now and then but it's also your kind of your, your immune booster for your plants as well. Uh, so. Um, so I love that, and it's a uh-huh. great product. But that, as well as all the other ferments and all the other extracts and all the other components that you do, that only makes up about 20% of what's effective in KNF. Okay. 80% of the efficacy of this system is the indigenous microorganisms that you're collecting and adding to your soil. Boom. I love and, it. And so this is the thing. It's the thing everybody does last. Yeah. It's one of the hardest ones to nail correctly. Hmm. But once you get it, mm-hmm. it's just like, I mean, I had a lemon cucumber that I pulled over 200 cucumbers off of this year. Mm. And they're prolific plants. I mean, but this was ridiculous. I, I was just like, this is absolutely nuts. Mm-hmm. After two years of treating my soil with IMO, mm-hmm. it was, I mean, the tomatoes were... The, it it was it was insane how much food went to waste on my garden because I couldn't get to it to, yeah. to harvest it. Well, so indigenous microorganisms, um, I I call those inoculations. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not real formally trained in all this, but I, it, a lot of it just made sense to me. And what I do is. Uh, Cook some white rice, put mm-hmm. it in a wooden box, yep. I, and specifically as it applies to cannabis, for example, if I have a whole row of cuttings, if I'm doing a production garden, for example, and I've got a whole row of cuttings, they're all the same plant, and you look at them, typically they're not all the same, even though they are the same. Right. Some of them clearly usually are doing better than others. And what I usually do is I would go to one of the ones that's really flourishing, and basically take an inoculation, oh, really? a cultivation sure. of what's going on in the biology of the soil right underneath that specific plant yep. and then spread that to the other cuttings. And I do see benefit from that. And yeah. Is that basically what you're talking about is a version of that? A version of that. A version so, of so it. That's, okay, so, that's very yeah. similar. Um, 
So the idea of, and we've totally gotten off subject of, of pesticides, but that's okay, we'll get back to it. it well, well, this, the, the health of the plants, the health of the plants and the soil really contributes yeah. to that pest management thing. It does, so, and, and this is like, you know, the basics. If you have the healthy plant, you don't need the pesticides as much. So you can use it as a preventative now and then mm -hmm. when you think about it, but if you don't have infestations, it's easier to just avoid that. Um, so when you're going out into the forest and you start like lifting up the litter mm -hmm. and you start looking, you'll eventually start finding areas that are really rich in mycelium. Yeah. So you'll see all that white, beautiful running, you know, mycelium. And that's where you want to set your, that same box, exactly yes. what you're doing there, but yes. put it there instead. Yes. And after anywhere from, and this is where it starts getting a little like touchy after anywhere from like five days to 13 days, depending yes. on your weather and your humidity and yes. where it is and yes. all of that, it'll culture that whole box. And you get all these beautiful colors and of different things going colors, on. But a, a lot of the white fluffy is what you're yes. really wanting. But we always have color in ours. There's yeah. always a little bit of pink Oranges and a little bit of yellow and, and a little white, bit of green yeah. and a little bit of this and that. So then you take that and what you want to do is you want to create a shelf stable product. Okay. So you're going to add it one to one with brown with sugar, ideally demerara or a raw sugar, but brown sugar works fine too. Yes. One to one by As weight. versus molasses that's unsulfured, for example. Molasses is not good. Okay. And the reason why is we're not looking for a sugar content on this. We're looking for the, what the sugar does is it actually draws all the water out of the microbes. Ah. And what you've okay. done is through the osmotic pressure of the sugar removing the water, the microbes then are basically dehydrated and they go dormant. And shelf stable. And now they're shelf stable for years. Blessed So be. now you have okay. all of those indigenous microorganisms <clears throat> that were thriving in that area, in that condition, with that temperature and that humidity and that time of year. Mm -hmm. And you have now encapsulated them on your shelf to be utilized when you need to later. And the sugar you're going about equal amounts of one to one volume wise by weight by not weight by volume. Okay. By, okay by weight not volume okay and then what you what you're really going after is doing this from a couple different spaces yes uh, on the on the season. land yes on your land every ideally, season okay. ideally 500 feet elevation above where you're growing oh really so hmm. yeah. i'd have to go to somebody else's land but to pull that one to. off but i don't i don't i mean what i love about this approach that what you just described is you are capturing the biology mm -hmm. that is working on your land yes. that is flourishing yeah. on your soil in the in the soil you have and so it seems to me you're you're basically helping nature to bridge into your garden or any place you're using this preparation exactly because mm. a lot of times our garden soils are very heavy on the bacteria they're mm -hmm. usually in fields they've mm. been you know disturbed they've got you know primary growth but not a lot of like secondary or tertiary growth yes. going on because we don't do it in the forest yes and so you're taking that fungally dominant forest litter which we know is so rich in humic acid and yes. and just all that yes. great stuff right yes, yes. and yes. whatever the biology is that's living in there at that time so then if you have you know a bunch of different IMO2 collections so IMO1 is when it's with the rice mm -hmm. IMO2 is when you add it to the brown sugar mm -hmm. and then you make something called IMO3 so you do a third and then you can go four and then you can go five as well and number three, you're taking a bunch of your different twos. Mm -hmm. So I would take something from my spring collection, something from my summer collection, something mm -hmm. from fall. I've yet to pull it. off a winter one, but someday I will, and I'll have that in there too. Uh -huh. Or, you know, if you have, you know, as your collection builds, you can start using more and more and more of them. Mm -hmm. And now you're inoculating a carbon and carbohydrate source. So you're using wood chips and a grain usually. Yeah. And you're making a bigger pile mm -hmm. and you're keeping it low in heat. So you're not composting it. You want to keep it below 130 degrees. Okay. So you're flipping it a lot. Uh -huh. You're turning it. And th you'll see that that fungal, high, that fungal uh, mycelium starts interwebbing all of that. And so now you have what's called IMO2, 3, pardon me, which also can be stored longer term once it's finished. But it's now encapsulating all of those different fungal collections that you mm -hmm. did so it's not just one kind that's dominant you've got a huge diversity and if you take that to your garden and you spread that out and you can your imo4 is the same thing but then you're adding soil from your garden so now it's the 
biology is really ready for exactly the soil that it's going to go into. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can do IMO5, which is adding a nitrogen source. So you can add that to a manure or something and you can make it go much further. Uh -huh. But what mm -hmm. the idea here, right, is you've added all this diversity to yeah. the garden soils, which means that no matter what's going on in the weather and the ground, you have some type of fungal microbe that is super duper happy in right those then conditions. in those conditions, yes. which means yes, your soil yes, yes. is always going to be fungally dominant, yes. which means that all of the crops that we grow, except for the brassicas, prefer a fungally dominant soil yes. your weeds die back mm -hmm. you have i mean i've had crazy like bindweed that gets covered in powdery mildew mm. climbing up like a cucumber which mm -hmm. should have powdery mildew and doesn't it's mm -hmm. just gorgeous mm -hmm. like no problems mm -hmm. i've had grasses that are really really difficult to deal with usually mm. that will sprout and then just like fall over and i'm like oh my god <laughs> this is really cool i mean people talk about um but that's so that implies that some plants don't like that environment and they happen to be a lot of the ones you don't want right so weeds so and and it really has to again coming back to nature when you see a disturbed area the first things to go there and be really happy in that area are your grasses so those are plants that prefer bacterially dominant soil most of the food crops that we eat and our cannabis and our trees and all of this prefer a fungally dominant soil. So they're, they don't, you know, the two of them together, once you start getting your fungal dominance up, your weeds just, they just don't do well. They don't communicate as well with the fungi, like in a forest. So, um, yeah, so you have less weeds, you've got less problems with that. Again, brassicas are different. I actually have an area now that's like my brassica area that I don't treat with any of this yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you use manures there, for example. I don't use anything for, there. I just you, kind of ignore it. <laughs> fair enough. Not the best fair brassica enough. grower, honestly. Okay. Okay. I love it, but it's just like, I'm like, huh. I actually pulled off some really good cauliflower for the first time ever, so that was exciting. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so, so you have your indigenous microorganisms, you've got already a stronger, healthier plant. Now, all of that being said, um, when you talk with like Chris Trump, he's just like, well, that's all you really need. You don't need the, you know, the pesticides because you, you don't have those problems. Mm -hmm. The thing with cannabis that often other farmers don't understand and why we see all these hemp fields, you know, declining and, and not doing well is because they're thinking of it like a normal plant where, you know, okay, if I have corn, I've got corn earworm, and that's basically all I really have to think about and deal with. Right. If I've got cabbage, it's a cabbage looper, maybe some aphids. Right. Uh, but, you know, everything loves cannabis. Yeah. Like yeah. every bug in the world loves cannabis. If it eats a plant, it's going to eat weed, and it's going to be really happy there. So we get into this problem of sometimes, you know, having healthy soil is not enough. Yes. So then what do we do? So we love the idea of putting out beneficial insects. We love the idea. The green lacewing cards are phenomenal. They're really cheap. It takes care of the majority of your pests. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now you invite all your friends over from the Dempure Collective and everybody walks through without thinking about the fact that they, you know, walked in their own garden that morning and now everybody has all the bugs that everybody else has. And, yes, you know, it's and definitely a thing that happens. It is. And we, you know... I, I love the idea that, or the ability that I have now to show off my farm, but I also do recognize the fact that, you know, more than likely that's where a lot of our pest problems come from. Mm. Other farms, mm. I have this amazing cutting of this crazy cultivar that everybody wants, and I'm going to gift it to you, but I didn't scope it, and it's got russet mites, and now... You have russet you mites. You have russet mites. Yes. We love yes. to share bugs. Um, so what do you do when you figure out that you're like, oh shoot, I wasn't scouting properly. I didn't pay attention. And now I have russet mites and I can see them with my visible eye. Yeah. So now we have a serious problem. You've got problem. a problem. Yeah. And I can't afford to cut down my cash crop and burn it and start over because my season doesn't work that way. So this is when pesticides come in, right? This is when your traditional farmer turns to Eagle 20 or avid or floramite or whatever the other crazy gnarly chemicals are because mm -hmm. they can't afford to do mm -hmm. anything else or so they think right so what do we as natural farmers do when we're at this problem like you know a lot of people just they're like oh i bought 
500 million ladybugs and, <laughs> and released them and they all flew away in they, three days. Yep. And then the ones that stayed pooped all over my weed and now I can't sell it. So this is where we kind of really got deep into the Jadam and into like, there's got to be better solutions and there has to be ways that we can do this economically. There's some products that are available that work really well, but they're mm. just, they're ridiculously expensive. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So the JWA we talked about, that's your mm -hmm. wedding agent. Mm -hmm. It does work pretty well on its own somewhat so like for, uh, soft some, bodies for the soft bodies yeah. so some yeah. of the aphids you know but the hop aphid or the um well what might be the hop aphid or the cannabis aphid whichever varietal it is now um that particular one just breeds so damn fast that yeah. even as you're killing it it's it's hard to keep ahead of it with just jwa so then we bring in the other two solutions that i love so jadam sulfur solution it's made similarly to the wedding agent and again, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the, um, that's usually made with lime to create the heat. Mm -hmm. The problem with the sulfur that you buy on the market nowadays is that because of the process that is used, it takes it from its elemental sulfur farm into, if I'm understanding correctly, and again, it's in Spanish, so it, I might be totally butchering the translations. But if I'm understanding correctly, the process that it goes through, that, that industrial ag uses to create these wettable sulfur powders and these, pow mm -hmm. these uh, liquid sulfur yeah. agents, yeah. right, yeah. Um, changes the, the form of sulfur. So it actually can cause resistance in pests. So now you have oh superbugs that are resistant to your sulfur because, unfortunately, as cannabis growers, most of us don't have horticultural backgrounds. We're not trained in how to use these products correctly. We don't use them at the right ratios or the right time frames. And so, you know, just like what we saw with spider mites in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. We're breeding bugs that are resistant to the tools we have. Crazy spider mites that were like next to impossible to get rid of, uh, which is why the flora mite of the world got really popular. So this sulfur solution, it's not doing that. You're, okay. you're, you're creating, you're doing it yourself and, um, and it's using, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on the recipe now because I've only done it once. Uh, at any rate, and this is the information's it, out there, it, yeah, the right? Information's Online. Out there. The mm -hmm. recipe's there. Okay. Um, and again, and this is the JDAM, uh, sulfur solution. Yep, yep, okay. JS. JF. JS, JS, Jadam sulfur. So JS, okay. JS. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so the great thing about all of this stuff is that like, you know, you use it at such dilute ratios that you can make it once and, and then it's shelf stable forever. And so, like mm -hmm. I said, like, why not make 50 gallons of wedding agent? I mean, you'll use it eventually and it doesn't mm -hmm. go bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jadam sulfur, same thing. Like you use it at very dilute ratios and it's, it's, it just, it works super well. I'm loving it super well. Okay. And because of the fact that it stays in its elemental form somewhat, mm. as far as I understand, mm. the bugs are not able to create the resistance to it. Um, you can use it every day. If you have a heavy infestation an hour before, um, sunset is the time that's, I, I think that the book says that you can use it anytime you want. For me, I'm not going to spray anything on my plants in the heat of the day. No, it's just, it's going to be problematic and it's going to dry up super fast. So I might as well spray it when the sun's going down enough light that I can see enough humidity in the air that it doesn't dissipate too fast. Right. And, um, so, I mean, we, I didn't do it every day. We did every other day for two weeks, which was probably a bit of overkill, but I saw no stress in the plant. There was no phytotoxicity going on. The russet mites that we had were, um, I actually didn't do it with just the JWA and JS. I added the JHS, which is the third component. Okay. So that's Jadam Herbal Solution. Okay. Uh, JHS. Mm -hmm. And that's one that you can get really creative with. There's a hundred, there's a, another book out there called a hundred herbs or something like that. It's, it's the other Jadam book. The okay. Jadam book is orange. This one is green mm -hmm. and is impossible to find. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course. Of course. So um, he lists the hundred herbs that he recommends for this. Mm. A lot of them happen to be herbs that are like in Korea. So like mm -hmm. I can't get Korean pasque flower. I'm not really wanting to use that anyway. 
but uh, we did, so the Jeruz- Jerusalem artichoke was like, I mean, mm-hmm. just, it's easy to grow, mm-hmm. it's easy to process, and it's, I mean, this, this whole, the way you do this, super, super simple. You're putting it in a pressure cooker or a crock pot, and you're just basically cooking it for eight hours on mm. high heat. Mm. And what you end up with is all those chemical compounds that have been extracted out into your water and then you're adding it to your other solutions and it's just this amazing trifecta of i mean we had a hemp cultivator in colorado that used uh, a garlic Mm -hmm. i think jhs Mm -hmm. i'm not a fan of that one but um because probably because I like garlic and why would I waste it on that? Yes. Um, so, but you can do it with like hot peppers. You can do it with garlic. You can do it with ginkgo. Uh, so the ginkgo leaves the Jerusalem artichoke. And then we went off script and used mm-hmm. California bay laurel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do need to talk with Chris because he says that I have something wrong in my thinking about how it works. Mm. But I also know that Korea doesn't have California bay laurels. They don't have laurel trees. So this wasn't something that they had access to, to, to trial out. So there, but I might be missing something. Um, and I'll find out soon what that is. Um, this person, Chris, his last name was hunt Trump Trump. No relation. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. 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 No relation. Okay, cool. Um, and he has a bunch of YouTube videos on how to make the Korean natural farming inputs. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's nuances and there are really key aspects that are missing in those videos. Uh-huh. Um, I watched them all and like did this for a year and was just like, this is amazing. I did it totally wrong. <laughs> it was, it was good. Good times. Uh, and, and so you would view the JDAM book, the orange one you yeah. mentioned as sort of the authoritative description of these various yes. preparations. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. And again, the only thing he's missing in that book, as far as I know so far, is he does not mention personal protective gear, PPE, per- yeah, personal protective yeah, equipment. Yeah, yeah. So when you're, you, you know, so the first time we started doing it, we opened the potassium hydroxide and it like kind of, you know, has some dust and we're like, hmm, yeah. we have goggles and we have gloves and we have, you know, hoodies and long sleeves, but we didn't think about a dust mask. So it, it became really apparent in about 10 seconds that we had to go get a dust mask. Yes. Um, so the same thing with the Jadam <clears throat> sulfur. He doesn't tell you, like, to, you know, really gear yourself up because the stuff gets hot. It's, it is noxious. These aren't pleasant things to work with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And the JHS also, that was my first one with Jadam, was the herbal solution that I did myself out of the Bay Laurel. And, uh, oh, my God, that stuff. So... The interesting thing, I did a bunch of research first, and I'm like, there's a compound called eugenol that's contained mm-hmm. in cloves mm-hmm. and in bay laurel. And mm-hmm. clove is one of the compounds that is recommended in the genome book. So I'm okay. like, okay, well, if the eugenol is the actual property that is pesticidal, it's in our bay laurels as well. It should be about the same. So I picked a ton of leaves, and I put them in the crock pot, and I weighted it down with these rocks, and I let it cook, and it was inside the house. Oh, mm. Yeah, that was a bad choice. After about 20 minutes, you could not go inside. Like the, the the very air would like just set off all the mucous membranes. I mean, my nose was running, my eyes imagine. were watering. Yeah. It worse, wow. so much worse. Like it, really it, highly concentrated really, bay laurel smell. Yeah. Because if you take those leaves and crush yep. them, it's a very strong, almost menthol-y right. kind of smell. Very strong smelling. That, and, and that's the eugenol. Yeah. And so now imagine that you took, you know, four, four pounds of these leaves and started like yeah. cooking them. So I decided I was like, this isn't going to fly. We're going to move this thing outside. So I got my extension cord and I, my crock pot, my pressure cooker is an instant pot. So it's They electric. work great, don't they? Oh, it's great. I love yeah. that thing. Yeah, yeah. I need to buy a new one because this one's fairly ruined now. <laughs> um, so I picked it up and I took it outside and I set it down and the little um, steam vent bipped and one little tiny drip and it had only been in there for for maybe half an hour landed right there on my cheek Uh, and I was like oh it's fine I'll just plug this in and you know and it's outside now and I started trying to plug the the pot back in and I was trying to push the buttons and all of a sudden I was like oh my god it's burning and I was like 
oh my God, it's really burning. It, I, I had to drop and everything. And not from temperature. Not from heat. Yes. I had to, from yes. the essential oils that were in yes. that bay leaf that were now extracted into the water that just flipped up out of the little steam vent. So that was my first, like, yeah, protective wow. gear. Yeah, is exactly. Be really Thankfully, essential it didn't with, land in your eye, I, right? I'm exactly. super Wendy. grateful. Yeah. So, yeah, I dropped everything. I ran inside. I, like, washed my face. I washed my face again. And then I started thinking about, oh, my God, okay, this was oil-based. So should I get the baking soda or the baking powder or do I grab a cucumber or is it milk? And at that point, I was, like, getting a little distressed. I couldn't I quite think. <laughs> And uh, I just ended up like using Technu, I think it was, and washing it off, and that seemed to do it's it. It's good but, at cutting oil. Yeah, yeah that yeah, was yeah, it was the closest thing in my bathroom that I could think of to use. And uh, so, but it was interesting because you know half an hour was all. Yeah. So now after eight, eight hours, eight hours, it's pretty potent. I'm pulling the rocks out, and at this point, I'm I'm ready. I've have like my respirator, and I've got big, huge kitchen gloves on, and and the protective eyeglasses which have holes in the bottom of them oh no yeah yeah because i guess they want you to not fog up or something i don't know so yeah i'm sitting there like okay i'm totally ready this time and i started pouring it into the jars because this is another one that's shelf stable if you Uh pour it all the way up and you seal it while it's really hot it'll self-seal you don't have to pressure cook it or hot water bath it or anything and then you can you know use it much later down the line so I'm pouring it in and it's just like, I, I was having the worst time because the scent was so strong. And I mean, it was like mm. absolutely burning my eyes. And uh, it was, it was, I was very impressed. At this point I was like, okay, this, what, I don't even know if this is right or not, but this is an impressive, like if I was a bug, I would not want that anywhere near me. Yeah. So uh great story about how important personal protective yeah. gear can be <laughs> um so i have a question at least one more if yeah. you don't mind yeah absolutely i'm really appreciating this information uh the jwa um as a wedding agent i'm imagining you know you've you've made 50 gallons of mm-hmm. this soap you only need what a teaspoon of it in a gallon a couple of drops in a gallon to make a spray so it it depends um, uh-huh. and there seems to be there's a in the jadam book he actually talks about infestation rates and okay. dilution rates so if you're just using it as a wedding agent um preventatively it's it's very dilute it's okay. um, uh, i believe it's like somewhere in the one to 100 or one to 50 yeah, like an ounce so, to a gallon, yeah, something like it, that. Yeah, not even mm-hmm. that much. Mm-hmm. Not, okay. Yeah, I mean, maybe about that much, I guess, actually. Yeah. Um, That'd be 128 to 1. Yeah, right. Yeah. I know. I was just doing that math, too. I'm like, oh, yeah. so it might yeah. even be less than the 1 to 100. I, I don't. Well, as a prophylactic, I, I could see it little. being pretty, pretty small. It was very little. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. as you increase in pest pressure and infestation, his recommended do- dosage goes up. Okay. And it's the same thing with the JHS. Uh-huh. So yeah, that we was my found, next question. Yep. Mm-hmm. So we found, um, so the first time I tried it, I didn't have the JWA yet. All I had was JHS, and I just tried it on my infested brassicas. Okay. I had a some type of um, aphid. I'm not good at aphid ID. I just yeah, 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 know there. that it's the fuzzy-looking one. Yeah. Um, and it was covering my kale it was super yeah, bad yeah, yeah. so i was like all right well let's check this out and i'm gonna start it at a very dilute ratio because having known what that splatter was like i just don't think i need a lot so i did it at one to 100 and it was it i mean it was very impressive i had about a 60 percent mortality with one spring wow and so i came back the next day and i was like that was pretty cool all right let's see let's you know crank it up a little bit more and so I think the next one I did was a one to 50 ratio. And I also had spider mites at that time on my violas. And this is the JHS Just the without JHS. the JWA. No okay. JWA. I didn't mm-hmm. use any mm-hmm. wedding agent. Mm-hmm. I didn't use the J- Dijam sulfur, none of that. And so the second spray at the one to 50 on the aphids killed everything it touched. So wow. there were some aphids that was a it was a curly kale, so they were like some of them were tucked up in it, and yeah. it didn't didn't do anything to those ones. But I mean, it was just it was it was really crazy. The spider mites on the violas, it didn't work on those. 
I was mm. like, okay. I mean, it, it mm-hmm. maybe did a little bit, but not so significantly not that so I could Not so effective really as it was with the aphids. Yeah. yeah, okay. So at that point then, um, a friend was coming over and we're like, let's make JWA. And neither, neither of us had done it before. So we're like, we're going to make like, you know, 100 gallons. He's going to take 50 with him and I'll have my 50 here. And so when that was done, I went back and tried that with the JHS on the spider mites again. And there was, it, something happened. Again, I was like, eh, I don't know if I'm super impressed with that yet. Yeah. Um, and at that point, then we were talking with Tina, who was who was adding JS, the Jadam sulfur, and she had resin mites, and she, all she had was the Jadam sulfur. So we started communicating, and she was like, "Okay, I'm going to make the JWA, and mm-hmm. I'm going to make the JHS, and I'm going to do it with garlic because that's what I have, and I think she did chili peppers, and um, and so she did the three of them, and together within I, I think it was like it was a very short period of time like two weeks basically she was just like we have full eradication like this is like it's it's killing Wonderful. everything um hmm. and another friend of ours was also doing it he did the california bay laurel jhs um maybe ginkgo but i don't really recall for sure if he used that and then the js and the jwa he used them at much higher concentrations than we had done and found that his plants didn't suffer at all. And again, he had pretty much eradication of the, of the, um, russet mites. That is so spectacular for something you can make on your farm. And pennies per gallon. Yeah. I mean, once it's diluted, it's, I mean, it's just phenomenally economical. And I love that it is the, you know, that you're not going to have to be concerned about residual breakdown products that you might with some of the store-bought products that you might think are going to be a better answer. I really, uh, I'm really struck by the, uh, the description you've given me this evening. Um, and for me too, like a big part of it is especially with cannabis in California and a lot of the states, the testing is so regulated that like I might buy something that says that it's, you know, clove oil and rosemary and, you know, all these wonderful little natural things. But then they slide pyrethrins in because it works really well. And yep. they maybe they're like, oh, it's maybe you don't know that it's chrysanthemum. And so you read it and you think you're OK. Or maybe they just don't even say it on the label. Like if I'm making it myself, I, think I know, you know what's, what's in there. there. Yeah, I know exactly if I know the plant and if I know the, what I'm extracting out of it, I know that I can use eugenol because yes. clove oil is acceptable. Yes. So I know that I'm good to go on that. Yes. yes. Oleander, I don't really know what the active ingredient that's exactly. pesticidal in there. I, chrysanthemum is one of them that is recommended. Uh-huh. I know I cannot use that because I know that's pyrethrin and I know that's restricted. Mm-hmm. But if you know what your restrictions are and you, you know, go through these herbs and you know that like, Capsaicin is your effective ingredient in hot peppers, right? So I right. know that that's okay to use. Right. So this becomes something that I have full control over yeah. everything I'm doing on my farm. Yes. I'm making it myself. I have no secondary guesses. People are like, how do you know you're going to pass pesticides? I'm like, <laughs> because I know. I know. <laughs> because uh, yeah. I made it. And if yeah. I didn't put it in it, it's, it's not, not there. there. Exactly. I really love also that you, uh, in, in, taking on using these preparations you first started off with crops that maybe not so valuable to you as starting right off with your cannabis uh, which uh, much respect for the wisdom (laughs) of that Uh, I am uh, grateful I'm going to find out more about JDAM and whatnot Uh, like I said I'd like to educate myself a little more fully on the things that I'm already been doing in some yeah. ways, mostly because for myself, I, uh, like I say, I've done some reading, but really in sitting in the garden and trying to understand what I'm seeing and what's going on there, I keep coming back to there the, that the plants that are here can provide the answers to the problems or questions that I have. It's simply me being open to them telling me what to do yeah. if you I, it's, it's all funny to go there but it does happen. no but i but something I, like I, that happens i totally to agree me. i so. i 100 <laughs> agree that there's there's a you know i mean like you can teach processes to people but you can't teach that communication you can't teach i mean i don't know it's it's funny to me to meet people that 
you know, they're like, oh, I, I can't tell what's wrong with that plant. And I'm like, you can't tell that that's a zinc deficiency. For example, like, I mean, I I just, you know, I mean, I, you see all the marijuana magazines now that have all the pictures of things that I'm like, Oh yeah, that was your ad. Oh my God. You don't see the pH imbalance that's showing with those. Woo. Okay. Yes. And it's just, it's just rampant. I've seen, there's no farming industry out there where like people don't know what they're doing the way that there is with us. With cannabis. And and I think a lot of it is that they're, there isn't that communication. There isn't that. I mean, like, you know, if you're a really good weed farmer, you're out there like just chilling with your plants all the time. And you just, you see the things that are there so much faster and you're in, and again, like, I don't know, for me, just taking it to that spirituality level where it's like you're outside where it's meant to be. And you're, you're in this space where there's, there is polyculture and there are those other things going on. And sometimes they're indicator plants where you're just like, Ooh, yes, you don't look good. And I know that you're a delicate little whatever you are. And so if you're not looking good, you guys are probably not feeling so good either. So now I know how to treat everybody. And I love uh, that uh, yeah. one of the things you mentioned is a concept of banker plants. Yeah. Um, love that whole principle as a way of just being aware. And it's <clears throat> I've come to realize that actually there's plants that one can use. Uh, to see what the state of the soil is, moisture content in the soil, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera, uh, in addition to um, the benefits that can happen for <clears throat> cover cropping or all of the other reasons to have other plants in your garden. I don't know if that made any sense at all. Yeah, no, it did, absolutely, yeah. and I, I want to know which ones they are. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I don't feel like we have much trouble with moisture content. We've just got great soil that yeah. deals with things really well. But um, but yeah, like things that would show wilting first. Yeah, there mm-hmm. uh, a friend who has a nursery, a uh, commercial nursery, uh, gifted me some seeds recently. And I am ashamed to say that I don't remember what he called them. But he says that they uh, they really like being uh, in the shade of a cannabis plant, and meantime they will droop, do that droop uh-huh. thing yeah. before your cannabis plants do, because by the time your cannabis plants are drooping, you've gone a little too long. Right. They're not happy about it, and right. you've hurt the roots. <laughs> and yes, you can water them, and they'll perk right back up. But anticipating the needs without having to, you know, every four times a day you're down on your hands and knees digging in the dirt making sure everything's still good because it's really hot today right and there's a breeze and i and i have to say honestly uh, part of what i'm loving about this not just the decrease in the cost and the knowing what you've got that you're putting on your plants but there's just the involvement the 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 extent to which you're there gathering those bay leaves you're there measuring out those various materials you're putting into this mix you're there holding that variable speed drill running this paddle <laughs> mixer dealing with the smell and knowing that what you're doing is going to be <clears throat> enhancing your garden and to me this is this is where intention comes into our work yes. and the importance of who you are and the integrity you bring to what you're doing. Yeah. I love you. Aww. Yeah, I, I just you. gotta say, that's so lovely. Thank you. Look at you tying that whole conversation into one of the key words of today. Love, yeah, and intention, I know. It was interesting, everybody was talking about intention in their own groups, like I was like, that's for